The Tangara, one of Sydney's most iconic, loved and hated trains. But the time on our rails is coming to a close. Labor promised if they were elected at the 2023 election, they would order their replacement. And since they won, they have until 2027. Since we might be waiting a while, and I'm trying to avoid big projects like the last one, I thought I'd take a look at railway developments around Australia and overseas to get a picture of what we might see. To start, let's do a quick overview of the Tangaras. They're a fleet of four car electric multiple units made up of 447, formerly 455 cars, and they operate all suburban services on the T4 Eastern Suburbs and Illawarra line, as well as shuttle services between Byrule and Port Kembla on the South Coast line. They also operate some services alongside newer Waratahs on the T1 Western, Richmond and North Shore line and the T9 Northern line. It's important to note that T1, T4 and T9 are the first, second and sixth busiest lines in Sydney, of which both the T1 and T4 both have issues with overcrowding. The trains themselves were built between 1987 and 1996 and have formed the backbone of suburban services in Sydney ever since. For the most part, they have performed well without any issues, and the main reason they're being replaced is just their age. While they still look modern, at least externally, there are some V-sets that are older than some of the Tangaras. So, yeah. They've also started to run into reliability issues, and refurbishing them is proving a pain, as a Tangara technology upgrade has shown. This, combined with the aforementioned high patient on the T1 and T4 lines, means they're starting to struggle. So, before I take a crack at designing a replacement, what's been happening with new trains elsewhere? So to begin, the most recent new suburban train order in Sydney was the Waratahs, which were delivered beginning in 2011. So, we'll look for trains after that date. Looking domestically, there's really not that much of note. Queensland and South Australia have new trains, those being the new generation rolling stock and the 4000 class respectively. The most notable feature of these is open gangway connections between cars. In general, open gangways provide more space for passengers and improve passenger flows, both increasing the capacity of the car and potentially reducing dwell times. As networks grow on patronage, it's an incredibly important feature. Next, we'll move on to Melbourne. And one feature of their high capacity metro trains and x 2.0s have is dedicated bike spaces, which might be a good addition. The HCMTs only have them in the same way we have wheelchair spaces on our trains, but the x 2.0s have them set up with a proper spot with a strap to hold them in place. So that might also be something to consider. Another feature is dynamic line displays that show the upcoming stop as well as where the train is going along the line. Currently, suburban trains in Sydney have these in the sense of the next station indicators at the end of the saloons and above the intercar doors, but these don't show the whole line and just scroll through the stations. This isn't great at letting you know how far away your stop is at a glance. So for the suburban network, it might make a good addition, especially if placed above or near the doors. We can also show how full each car on the train is, which combined with open gangways, might be a good way of encouraging people to spread out throughout the train more. Now, with that, and my first point, you may be thinking, Sydney Metro has both of those features, and you'd be correct, but if I talk solely about Sydney Metro for this section, it would be rather boring. However, one feature Sydney Metro doesn't have, that I think should be introduced to the Bourbon Network, is external destination information displays. Okay, I know there's a reason Sydney Metro doesn't have these, I just needed a transition. So, the new intercity fleet, a topic for a future video, has external destination displays. These can be incredibly useful for telling people that a train that just pulled up is going where you want it to, especially if you're rushing and don't have the time to look at a normal station destination indicator. Another feature they, and Sydney Metro actually have, is USB charge points, which I shouldn't have to explain why they'd be useful, especially in our age of mobile devices. My friend Kira also added a note here saying they should be USB-C too, as they provide higher power, but I'm fine with either. And while we're on the topic of suggestions from friends, although this isn't a domestic development, nor very serious, one of my mates, whose train crew, wants the doors to close harder and faster, so if someone decides to block the door, they can have their stuff broken. While I think that's a bit harsh, to be fair, if you're an ass and block the door, you probably deserve it. And apparently, this is normal for trains in Japan, with train doors being able to close with a force of up to 500 newtons, while seemingly doors in most other parts of the world top out at 150 to 180. So, yeah, I guess this may be a good way to stop people blocking the doors at the cost of a few broken limbs here and there. So, moving away from violence, I see four features we should integrate into our next generation train. Open gangways, as this will potentially provide more passenger space and better passenger flows within the train. 
dynamic line displays and external destination displays, as well as a greatly improved wayfinding for passengers and USB charge points, as this would allow people to charge the device while commuting. The one feature I'm not sure if we should include is a dedicated bike space. On one hand, yes, we want to be encouraging people to cycle, and it's quite annoying to get around people's bikes when they have them in their vestibule. But on the other hand, doing so would take up space that otherwise could be seating. I think if we were to do it, I'd like to see more accessibility spaces with folding seats on the train, and all be equipped with a bike strap, as this both increases the amount of wheelchair spaces and allows bike spaces without compromising much on seats. There is one issue I can see. Potentially, someone could board the train with a bike and not have a dedicated space for them, which leaves them with no choice but to sling it up in the vestibule. Reducing passenger flow near the doors, and considering this would be likely to occur during busier periods, it's a serious issue. Maybe we could wait until the X-Track 2.0 is in the service and see how it goes for them before we make a decision. So, moving on, what about internationally? What can we learn from overseas? Well, I looked around to see anything I can point to as an example, and found Paris's RER network. In recent years, they've introduced a few new trains, of which we'll start with the MI09, which was introduced in 2011 and was based on the MI2N from 1997. So, yeah, turns out you can put more than two doors per side of a double-deck train. Is it practical? Eh, probably not, considering the MI09 is basically a train of stairs, but at least it loads and unloads quickly. So, maybe we should consider it. Or, maybe something more sensible. Introduced in 2013, we have the Regio 2N, which is a double deck train, albeit with shorter single deck sections with doors between the double deck cars. We could potentially do something similar, with two doors on each double deck section and four doors on each single deck section, which would give us up to eight more doors on each side of the train, which would dramatically speed up loading and unloading. It would also increase the size of the vestibule, potentially reducing crowding of the doors, which is a big issue for our double deckers. And doing so might improve loading times without making a train of stairs. The downside is there will be more points of articulation, which might add to maintenance requirements. But moving on from the French, the Japanese have been working on some cool stuff too. So one thing you need to know about the Japanese is that they tend to be a decade or so ahead of everyone else when it comes to train design. While we got chop control in the 80s, they had it back in the late 60s, that sort of thing. With that, you can probably guess where I'm going now. So modern trains use what's called an insulated gate bipolar transistor variable voltage variable frequency drive. Right now, this is the most common way of controlling motors on trains, and in simple terms, they control the speed and power of the motor by varying the voltage and the frequency of the AC power running to the motor. It does this through the aforementioned IGB transistor, which is just a switch that can turn on and off really, really fast. I'm many things, and evidently an engineer is not one of them. So for now, that's the best I can explain it. While that's the standard, the Japanese produce a new design that uses silicon carbide instead of silicon. This has the advantage that the diodes can be made significantly smaller, leading to a smaller traction system which is more efficient. And this is proven technology for suburban and metro applications, with the recent E235 series in Tokyo using it. And apparently, even the new intercity fleet here uses them, which would make sense as Mitsubishi worked with UGL to provide the electrical systems, and they also provided them for the aforementioned E235 series. So, for our Tangara replacement, assuming the cost isn't too high, and UGL got the contract, it could be a great way to improve on the existing 4th generation design. And with that, I couldn't really find anything else to import. So, let's move on to how we can directly improve on the existing Waratah design. So, where do the Waratahs fall behind? From a passenger perspective, I think one of the main concerns is around comfort. I don't know if everyone will agree with me on this, but in my opinion, each generation has had worse seats than the last. Compare the seats of the Tangara fleet to the Millennium or Waratah fleet. The Tangaras have far more padding and as a result, they're far more comfortable. So, I would argue that our new train should focus on improving the quality of the seats. The other area is the air conditioning. I'm assuming most of you have been on a train on a hot or humid day, and it's not comfortable. As far as I'm aware, this is not because the air conditioning unit isn't capable of getting the train to a comfortable temperature, but because they're set warmer to save power. Assuming that's true, the energy savings can't be worth it if it means everyone on a Waratah feels like they're in a sauna. But, if that's not the case, well we can just add a more powerful system. So, after recording this video, I posted to Twitter complaining about how it seems the Waratah fleet never seems to have the air conditioning on at all, and an anonymous source reached out to me to say it's kinda true? Turns out the Waratahs have a smart aircon, unlike all other trains in the fleet. 
which generally set a temperature and then try to stick to it. On the Waratahs, a computer tries to keep the temperature within specific bands of temperature that change based on the outside temperature and passenger load. So if the temperature outside is higher, it'll keep the inside temperature higher to save energy. The issue is, it's completely munted. Here's one of the photos I sent showing one car where most of it's around 25 degrees Celsius, which the smart aircon views as too low when compared to the temperature outside. So instead of just not cooling for a bit and waiting for it to pick back up, it turns the heater on. <laughs> Apparently this has been an issue with Waratahs going back a decade and no one fixed it, which is just a massive joke if ever I've heard one. Potentially, this would be easier assuming we're able to shrink the motor control system by switching to silicon carbide inverters. So, maybe that's a reason to do it. Also, we could add door buttons akin to those on trains in Victoria and Queensland to only open doors when needed, but I went into detail on that on the previous video. Okay, so now we've identified everything we need to know before designing a new train. Assuming they directly replace the Tangaras, they'll be working some of Sydney's busiest lines. The current double deck design has issues with crowding around doors during crush loads, and there are areas we'd improve in regards to passenger comfort, amenity, and wayfinding, as well as newer methods of motor control. So, now if we discuss the new developments, how would I design the replacement? Well, I'd obviously include the features I've discussed prior, but what about the actual train? As the French have shown us, there are many ways we can go about the deck and door layout of our new trains. So, I'm going to run through and talk about some proposed ways of going about them. If you're wondering why they're all drawn in pixel art, the only thing I know how to draw in is open TDD sprites. So, anyway, the first is just a boring double decker, again, speaking candidly, this is probably what they're going to go with. It's straightforward and it does the job. Just take the existing Waratah design, add the features I mentioned before and boom, you got a new train. But that's not all that interesting and it doesn't really help with the overcrowding issues I mentioned before. So what else could we do? Well, if people are crowding around the vestibules, just make the entire train a vestibule. Obviously this entails a metro style single deck train, but it means we could add more doors, which help reduce those dwell times, meaning we can run more trains. We could either copy Melbourne or Sydney Metro with three doors per side per car, or if we want, we could go copy that weird Yamanote Line E231 series train that had six doors per side. I don't think we'll need that, but we could. So with the doors sorted, the question then becomes the sitting layout. Longitudinal provide the most passenger space and allow the cars to load and unload the fastest, but it's the least comfortable option and the suburban network is not a metro. People will be on these trains for upwards of an hour in some cases. And I don't know about you, but I'm not sending all the way from Penrith to the city. So, what's the alternative? Well, we could have some transverse sitting, which would be more comfortable, and it's worked on Melbourne's suburban network. It also has the benefit of improving the comfort of passengers, which as I mentioned prior, has been an issue with previous trains. The issue is, it costs passenger space, reducing the capacity of the train, and it reduces the time it takes for the train to load and unload. So a single deck is an option, Maybe for some routes, such as the T2 local to Parramatta and T8 to Reesby via the airport. But I think we want to train this more universal. So what else could we do? Well, we could take a page out of the French's book and do a mixed single and double deck train. Which may seem radical, but Sydney's done it before with single deckers and Tullock double deck trailers. Albeit, the reason they did was less out of a need and more due to a lack of double deck motor cars. But we could use that as a template and mix our two previous proposals like this, with single deck metro style cars with all longitudinal seating, sandwiching double deck cars with transverse seating. This would give us the standing space we need, which would be a massive benefit for people coming from nearby stations like Walleye Creek, Newtown, Chatswood, etc., where the trains often arrive chockers, while still providing the comfortable seating that passengers traveling from the extremities of the network need. The biggest downside of the design is that stations where the train loads and unloads most passengers, such as the City Circle, you don't have the full benefit of metro style cars because the train will still have to wait for the double deckers to load and unload. But if the train is loading faster, closer to the CBD or busy stations because of the metro style cars, that time could easily be made up for. So if I were in charge of replacing the Tangaras, I'd probably go with this design. It is the best of both worlds in my opinion. I know we're probably not gonna get anything like it and the new train will just be Waratah 3.0, but it's still fun to discuss other possibilities. I do hope that when they order the new trains, they have the features I mentioned and put a focus on comfort because as I demonstrated, there's plenty we can learn from other states and other countries. Also, 
Big thanks to Scandinavian101 on Twitter who I commissioned for the thumbnail image. Their stuff is great and you can find their socials in the description. Also, also, I'm trying to learn how to code my own GRS, so I can do it So at some point, I might release the trains I've drawn here as a set for people to play with. If I do, I'll put it in the description or make a pinned comment. Otherwise, if you enjoyed, a like and subscribe would be appreciated. If you really enjoyed, you can find my Kofi in the description. Any ongoing donation will get your name in the credits, as well as early access to scripts so you can know what I'm working on. Either way, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.